please do take a seat. Eddie, will you come and join me? Everyone, this is Eddie. He's one of the Go family. He's an amazing evangelist. <laughs> That's an awesome evangelist. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Well, this morning, I woke up, and the Lord said, I want you to share something this morning. I said, well, what? And he said, what I gave you right in the beginning. And so, September 28th, 1994, <laughs> the Lord brought me to this wonderful kingdom. <laughs> and I've never been the same. I hadn't gone to church. I'd never read the Bible. Someone gave me a tract. I didn't even have the faith to believe, but I said, you have to help me. And he just gave me that faith. Baptized in the Holy Spirit the next day, overnight, off drugs, off all addictions, praising God, writing poetry, hearing from God audibly the one time, which I'm going to share with you today, what he said to me. Now, think, I've not been to church. I've not read the Bible. And someone in my room said, Ted, I'm like, I went in my, I went around my flat and there was no one there. I said, Ted, read the Bible. It's not much time. I'm having to shake up and wake up to church. And I'm like, what do you mean? In my head, I think. When, and all I got, the idea was that he's having to shake and wake up those people that he'd called because they weren't going out and doing and obeying what he told them to do. So there's a shaking coming. And so the next day, after I'd just been baptized in the Holy Spirit, I start writing a poem, and the poem is to the converted. I've not read the Bible, I've not been to church yet. I'm thinking to myself, why am I writing this? And of course, I've wrote reams of poems since, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So I'll just read this. And um, there's a scripture I put in years later when I started to read the Bible. I'd rather you hot or cold. And if you're lukewarm, well, you know the answer to that. To the converted, O oh, you of little faith, why do you tarry? Stay close to me, because it's I that you will marry. The time is soon upon you. Look up to the skies. The prophets I sent to you have told you you all really need to die. The law I've showed to you, it won't twist just to fit your day. But those who twist the scriptures, well, they really have to pay. Oh, you bend them just a little, well, you may as well not comply. I know you try your best, but don't you really, really want to fly? Yes, I am slow to anger, but I know what's written on your hearts. You believed, yes, on my son, but that's really only where it starts. Oh, I'm just off center a little bit. I'll, I'll get back the next day, but my heart is full of sorrow. Because it ends up you'll have to pay. I want all of you, and I want you all the time. And when I say I want you, I want you to be mine. Now, Moses knew me very well. He followed my decrees. So follow my law now. It's then that you'll see me. Ask this man who wrote this <laughs> what dream he had last night. Yes, it's I who told him to carry on the fight. Good will conquer evil comply with my law. You know that I'm always going to pick you up off the floor. I said that I saved you. 
when you believed in my son, it will all be sorted out on judgment day. Just let my will be done. Yes, a young Christian he may be, but I gave him the sight to preach to the converted, yes, with all his might. Thank you, Eddie. A very timely poem for us, and just incredible how God has inspired that when you'd just never read his words. So thank you very much. I'm going to pass over to Mike, who is going to preach for us, just to pray for you quickly. Father, we thank you for our pastor. We ask for you to really bless him and his family. We just love them so much. We just ask that you would equip him by your Holy Spirit to bring us the word and that you'd open our ears to it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks, Liam. Uh, if you want to turn your Bibles to Revelation chapter 3, uh, for those of you that haven't got it, it will be on the screen. And just as you're finding it, and it is good to find it and not just rely on the screen, although don't feel condemned if you are relying on the screen, uh, I, more and more I just feel like we just need to keep reminding Christians to pick up a hard copy of the Bible and read it and write notes next to it and, uh, and love it with all their hearts. I, I think I mentioned before to the worship team today, and it's not in my notes today, but it just is very strange that this week we've had this massive earthquake and Sardis, which is a church we're looking at, is in the same region. And in AD 17, they had a massive earthquake that wrecked all the buildings. There was none left and they had to rebuild it themselves out of their own wealth. And as we'll find out as we go into this, there was a, an idolatry of money in those days and that's how they were able to rebuild it. But I found it very interesting that in the same week we land on Sardis, Something like that has happened in the same place again, and the same message really is here for the whole world. We've got to wake up to Jesus, because the things we're holding on to, the buildings, the money, and everything, they are so fragile, aren't they? We need Jesus. So let's read from chapter 3, 1 to 6. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of God, my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life but will acknowledge the name, their name before my Father and his angels. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Lord, make this relevant to us today. Make this your word in our hearts today and help us to really live it. And we know it's significant in this week uh, with all that's been going on in the news with the Church of England. And we pray, Lord, that you help us understand that today too. In Jesus' name, amen. So this very scripture, uh, Jesus talks about waking up. And I think the best thing we can do is to start to think about how important sleep is. I know there's a few babies around the room today, and you really know, parents, how important sleep is. But you don't remember how to get it, right? <laughs> and, uh, I've been there three times in recent years. I'm still not sleeping, even though that one of them is eight. So just um, have that as a, a discouragement for the rest of the day. <laughs> but sleep is important, isn't it? Um, and there are dangerous times in the world where you don't want to sleep. And one of those things would be like driving, you know, sleeping whilst driving, not a good idea, right? The other thing, sleeping when you have toddlers in the house, another really bad idea. Uh, I had a lady in this church called Dee Dee a number of years ago, and uh, when we first had children, and she said to me, oh, you know what I used to do, Mike, when, when we had toddlers, we had two or three of them running around. I said, what was that? She'd go, we'd go up into the loft room, 
and I would lay across the door and go to sleep and let them go wild, you know, because they had to come through the door to get out, and I'd wake up. And you know what? If you're, if you're there today, I'm not sure if this would go down well with social services or not, but I would try it, you know, <laughs> just give it a go, right? And uh, so there are dangerous times to sleep. I had a, a very serious, a very good minister uh, say to me once over coffee, he goes, Mike, I went out to see a lady, and uh, she was a, an elderly lady, but she did go on a bit, you know, and to be fair, I felt his heart, because some people do, and he said, so I'm sitting there in this pastoral conversation, and my eyes start to roll, and I said, what happened? He said, I fell asleep. <laughs> I said, how did she respond? He said, I woke up, and she was still going. <laughs> And then, like, if you knew who this minister was, I wouldn't say it without his permission, but uh, it, he's just not the sort of person you'd expect it from. Me, maybe. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and I wouldn't apologize, really. I'd just say, look, please, I'm tired, or please stop boring me. It's, uh, it's too much. But there is a dangerous time to fall asleep as Christians. Any time to fall asleep from the way of God as Christians is a dangerous time. And, and I want you to know that this scripture today, we're looking at a, se- a series called Awaken the Church. That's why we're looking at Revelation. I felt led to this series at this time. I've been putting it off for a long time, and I felt like now is the time. And this week, the theme of this passage is wake up. Wake up. And this is a message that we need to grasp in our hearts, because in this modern day as pastors, the congregation tell us off for preaching things they don't want to hear. And like, I'm the worst guy in the world to do that to because I'll just do a series on that one thing if, if you tell me to stop <laughs> preaching it. Because I lost the care or the care for, for people's uh, ears or, or people's hearts to love me. I, I, I lost that a long time ago. I just want the Lord to love me. And I, I mean, it's nice to be loved, but I really want to know that I'm doing his will. And I never want to do your will. You know, I love you and I like you and I want to be your friend. But I don't want to be your friend more than I want Jesus to be honored in this world. And so this is wake up. And we need to hear it because the church is in a bad place all over the place. But we don't need to be, do we? We don't need to be. So let's go in and, and really unpack it and see what it says. In the verse 1, it says, To the church of Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits. Now, again, as I said in the first week, uh, we have been looking at Jesus and the description of Jesus in chapter 1. And every week at the beginning of each church, the letter to the churches, we find that it points back to the description of Jesus in one line. And he points back, John, now to Jesus in chapter 1 as the one that holds the seven spirits. Now, there's something we need to know, and I keep repeating this. The, word, uh, the number seven is really important. It's important because it means wholeness and completion. So when it says that Jesus holds the seven spirits, it's not that there's seven Holy Spirits. It's saying that he holds the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And so what it's telling us, and we know that he holds the seven stars, you know, we know that he holds the seven lampstands, which be, it is the church. What it's telling us is that the wholeness of the Holy Spirit is in Jesus, and the whole of the church is in his hands. Is there any safer place to be than in the hands of Jesus who holds the fullness of the Holy Spirit? Is there? There is isn't, is there? And, and the question we need to ask ourselves, before I trip over and kill myself, there we go been annoying me. And uh, the thing that we need to ask ourselves is, does the church hold the fullness of the Holy Spirit? There's a question. Some of them, all of them, none of them, certainly not all of them right now. Certainly not all of them. But last week we had a prayer meeting and uh, I've been extraordinarily busy as a pastor in the last two months. I'm not even exaggerating. And I turned up to this meeting thinking, I don't have a plan, Lord. I need you to do it. And I did say to everyone, look, I've got pretty much most nights this week I'm out, and so I'm probably going to stick to time unless the Holy Spirit turns up. Guess what he did? <laughs> I'm like, Lord, please, you know, any other week, you know, j- just think about it, please. And uh, so we're in this meeting, and, uh, and suddenly there's someone's, uh, someone turns up off the, off the community needing help, how they know we were there, don't know. And uh, so that happened, and then we prayed on uh, as a group, 
and then people were jumping, and they were dancing, they were singing out, there was, uh, you know, people uh, speaking in tongues, there was pictures, there was words, I'm like, 8.30 nearly, Lord, do you want to cut it off now? And, uh, and, and then the thing as well, someone was struck by the Holy Spirit, I, I'm told, afterwards for about two hours, you know, when it just couldn't move or something, and uh, I went home, obviously, pastor, but still wanted to go home. And, uh, but uh, I was so glad for that person. Uh, and, but what I'm trying to get to is we want that as a church. But we don't want it just so that God can reveal his power. We want to be in relationship with God in such a way, in such a way that we're moving in his spirit, listening to his will. And that's the first thing we get from this scripture is that we want the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We want what he has to be given to us. Does that make sense? That's who we want to be. So the next thing that we need to look at is Sardis, the town, the city of Sardis. In AD 95, when John was writing, it was in decline, actually, but it was still on a trade route, lots of trade routes. It was a very wealthy place, and people would come from all over to this little or, you know, sizable city, and it was a place that was known for its money, that they were self-reliant. They'd had that earthquake. They'd rebuilt the place on their own by their own money. So Sardis was a very wealthy place. Place. In fact, it was the first place in the world where they first minted money. If you want to know where modern money comes from, it came from this place in Sardis. It was a place known for money. The other thing is that the king had all of his, King Crucis had his, his treasury and all of his treasures in this place. There was rumors that there was gold dust in the rivers around Sardis. This was a wealthy place place. They had lots of money, they had lots of idolatry, and they were just self-absorbed. Burglars were known to take special trips to Sardis to go and steal at night, and the houses had bars on the windows to try and stop them from stealing at night. They had stuff to hang on to. This was a wealthy place, and uh, David Pawson described it as this. This is what they were summed up as, self-sufficient, self-confident, and self-indulgent. That is what they were described as. Now, how does the church play into that? How do we get to the church of Sardis? Well, Jesus says this, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Just let that sink in. I don't know how many of you there are today. Add your children in, what, 300, 400 people. What a thriving church we are. Isn't it wonderful to have so many people in this place? We've got all the lights. We've got all of the tic-tac-toe stuff over here. We've got all of the, the gump. And if anyone went round Rygate and said, do you know a church round here? I'm sure they would say, well, Rygate Baptist is one of those. What a wonderful reputation to have. And Jesus says, you have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. The scary thing about this is that The reputation of being alive as a church could be the sign that you are decaying and dying. That you could say all the right things. You can raise your hands up in the air and you could be dead as a Christian. You may have all of the signs of a living church, but you may not have Christ. Think about that for a minute. There could be a little chapel down the road moving in the spirit with two or three people in there, and they could be more alive than this church. I'm not saying we are dead, but I'm saying what this says is don't rely on the number of people, the things we have to say that you are alive. Danger. Danger. When you start to look at all the programs you run and all the things you have and all the people that come, saying that you're alive, it is the most dangerous thing you could ever, ever have. It can hide a multitude of sins, right? Not just love but also the hype. Some people say to if you want the church to grow, you must uh, have big bands. You must have a a good preacher. We're still searching. And uh, (laughs) you must have a, you must have, well, Linz does all right. Well done. And uh, can't bring her into my jokes. And uh, a thriving children's work. You must nowadays, you know, it's amazing. Go, Go onto any church website and look at the roles they have. You know, you must have a, a communications officer. You know, someone that's going to communicate across. I tell you, I don't know how Jesus coped with his 12 disciples, you know. I just, I can't believe the people weren't coming up to him when he fed the 5,000 and said, where's your communications officer? I don't like the fish, you know. I mean, <laughs> it's mad, isn't it? But here's the thing. What happens when you don't have those things? Does the church stop? 
Do the people go down to St. Mary's or up the hill? Or do they go across the Red Hill Baptist or maybe Hawley Baptist in that way? Why don't we just go find the church that's got all the roles we expect from a church? It could be dead. You might be dead. Because if you're thinking about those things, but think about it like this. If those things aren't happening and you aren't going to find another church, you know, if you're not going to go and find it elsewhere, let me ask you this question. What happened to the calling to a church? Did you pray about the church that you attend? No, I'm going to go to St. Mary's because they've got more pastors. Oh, I'm going to go down to Christ Central because they've got a coffee shop. You know, I'm going to go to Rygate Baptist Church because they've got the best looking pastor in town. You know. <laughs> I was talking about her, all right? <laughs> do, you see, do you see the problem, though? What happened to calling to church? Because people come in here and say, we haven't got this, you haven't got that, this ain't happening, that ain't happening. It's like, oh, sorry, I tried my hardest, right? But I tell you what, we like to pray, we love to keep to Scripture. We don't like to just show off the stuff that we have and, and, and the things that we have. We've got to be really careful because all those things do not see, all, all the communications officers and big bands and all that stuff, that does not tell you if a church is alive does not tell you if a church is alive, because actually often those things are geared up towards the world. And so I just want, I want us to be at that. When Jesus says that you have a reputation of being alive and you're dead, we need to prayerfully ask Jesus where we're at. I have been walking around the hospital nearly, well, every other day. And, uh, and I, last night I was walking down singing. People must think I'm mad. But I've been saying to the Lord, Lord, I am so tired, so empty, and sometimes I feel a fraud. I do sometimes. And, and so I'm saying to the Lord, can you speak to me in this situation? Are you here in here? Are you, are you there? Uh, that lady that keeps standing, does she need help? Should I do this for you, Lord? You know, what's going on? I want to be close to you. And so I'm walking down these, these hospital corridors singing, it's your breath in our lungs. And I'm thinking, actually, maybe I'm not such a, a fake Christian after all, because I actually really want you. But I don't always feel like the most holiest person in the world. And I don't feel like I'm like the, the Christian that stands out. And, and I'm looking at churches online this week, and, and um, I'm just getting annoyed, really, because I, I'm watching, I mean, my, to give you an idea, my wife said to me, you're looking more like John Eglinton every day. Um, <laughs> apparently, <laughs> apparently, he's my, my model for dress. And, uh, and, but I'm watching, because I don't, you know, uh, me and John share some good stuff. And, um, but I'm watching online, and all I see is pastors and preachers who want to be cool, like wearing hats and beanie hats at the age of 50. I mean, it isn't cool, really, right? <laughs> and the only way I'd ever do that is if this starts to go a bit further. But, but here's the thing. I'm seeing it. And they put these little voices on, like, you know, really cool voices. And I'm like, stop it. Just stop it. And it really winds me up because I'm sitting there thinking, it's just this. It's just this. And all that stuff is fake. And Jesus, he, he looks at the heart. Yeah, and it's man that looks at the outward appearance. And we want to be people like David that are after your own heart, God. And I just want us to stop it. I don't want us to be a church that has a reputation of being alive, but, you know, we're dead. I want us to be real. And that when we're going through difficult patches, that we come together and pray together rather than criticize each other and want to point the blame. I want us to be a church that really love each other. Because that's how they will know you're my disciples, that you love one another. And that you follow my instructions. We're talking about, you know, that song just before about, it's not much, but, but uh, you know, I give him my heart. You know, I, listen, if we give our hearts to Jesus, it will be an obedient heart. Not just one that sings about it. And I know that's true of the person that was singing about it. And I think we, we need to take hold of that. He wants us to give our hearts. It needs to be an obedient heart. We could be dead. But it's not too late today to turn to Jesus and to come back alive. Because a thriving church may be the sign it's a dying church. So Jesus says, verse 2, following on from that, Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief. And you will not know at what time I will come to you. He's not here yet. It's okay. Um, <laughs> It says, strengthen what remains before it dies. You know the great thing about when Jesus says that? He hasn't given up on his church. He's saying, strengthen what remains before it dies. He believes they can turn back. He's saying, 
you have chance, you have time, you, you have hope. Just, just do it. And then he says, go back and look at the things you heard at first. And we heard that uh, in your poem just before, didn't we? That go back and hear the things you've heard at first. Jesus is saying, true doctrine, the doctrine that saved your soul. Go back, study it. Don't listen to that tripe that's being thrown around by the bishops today. Listen to the truth that is in here. Go back, go back and realize. And then he says, repent, strengthen what remains, look at what you heard at first, and then repent, turn back, and go back to what you heard at first. That's what we're talking about. Then you're not a dying church. Then you're a living church. The commentators say that Sardis is a church that softened themselves because of all their idolatry of money, and they softened themselves to the community, and they were drinking and indulging, and they were idolatrous. And when we think about Jesus, what Jesus said about the Noah times, he says that they were drinking and getting married. They were eating, drinking, and marrying, and then the flood came. I'll come like a thief in the night. I'll come when you, you least expect me to come. I will come. Don't be drawn in by the communities around you. Do what I ask you to do. After 2,000 years of church doctrine, the church is apologizing to the communities. They're apologizing publicly for standing on God's word. Yes, we apologize for the way we've used it in the wrong way, but we must not apologize for what God's word says. We don't apologize for God. Who do you think you are? You cannot apologize for God, and you cannot reconsider his doctrines. 2,000 years. You know, the one thing they don't consider is, oh, well, we have so much more knowledge today, so therefore we can change doctrine. Listen, the people that wrote it were closer to the context and understood it more than we do. But we seem to think that they were stupid and thick, and therefore we can change it. No. It's grievous to the Lord. Are we flowing in the Holy Ghost? Are we grieving Him? What do you want to be? The modern society is telling us what God is allowed to say, do, and how we should live. Do you see a problem with that? The world needs to wake up too. You know, we got the, you, know you get these uh, people that go and do the whole eco, you know, climate change uh, protests. And, uh, and uh, what's really funny, and I, I'm up for looking after the planet. I think we should. It's biblical. Um, but what's really interesting is they need to wake up too. Society needs to wake up. Because I was just watching something this week about the cloud. You know, the cloud that we say things to? Oh my gosh, we are such hypocrites. You know, we go out and we say, oh, we've got to save the planet. So let's go and stand on the motorway and stop the lorries moving because they are killing the planet. And they take pictures on their phones and they take videos on their phone. And it gets uploaded to the world. The cloud, yeah? And, and the cloud's great, isn't it? Because they have these little sensors that no one can see and they need more water than you can really, really cope with. Uh, and they have more electricity going through them than anywhere else in the world. You know, 13 to 14% of Ireland's electricity gets sent to running the cloud, yeah? Think about that. It takes one center that runs one center of, uh, of backup for a big car company, so they've got all of their stuff backed up. It, one of those centers takes 100,000 houses worth of electricity. And every time those people stand on the streets and say, oh, you're killing the world, they're taking pictures, uploading it into nowhere, and killing the planet. We all need to wake up. We all need to wake up. But most of all, the church needs to wake up and realize that not only are we becoming self-righteous in the world, the church is becoming self-righteous in a way that they're telling God that he is wrong. Now, these words that Jesus tells us about, he says, wake up. He says, wake up. They weren't words given to the church by accident. It wasn't like, well, I think I'll tell him to, to wake up today. That sounds like a good one for them. He knew what was going on in their, their, their whole context. He understood you know that um, there, was a, there was a time, so Sardis is built on a rock, and there's only one road in. So there's a great big cliff. You cannot get up there apart from this one road. And they would sit sort of dozens of, of sentries and, and soldiers there, not many really, to protect this city. They were so confident it couldn't be broken that they made these guys stand there at this one road in so no one could conquer it. And no one could. And uh, Cyrus came along, and they couldn't get in, and, and suddenly they're there going, well, how are we going to do this? We'll give a reward to any soldier that finds us a way in to conquer these people. So they sat, and this one man studied and studied, and suddenly one of the soldiers dropped his helmet from the cliff, and it dropped down onto this, this area, and he's like, oh, that's interesting. 
And he realized that the soldier went and got it back. And they're like, well, he didn't come out the one road in. How did he do it? And so this guy realized that there was a hidden path that no one knew about. And what they did at night is they went up this hidden path and they conquered the city, all because of the helmet that fell down. Now, years later, 200 years later, exactly the same thing happened again. And they were conquered again by that path. And they didn't take note of the fact that it happened the first time. That's how they got it. And they were conquered too. So Jesus knew that this was a a city that fell asleep. They were caught napping. They didn't take uh, take advice from themselves. They didn't learn from past mistakes. And they were conquered again. And he's saying, wake up. Not only that, the people that conquered it came like a thief in the night. Do you see how Jesus talks through his scripture? He knows what he's doing. And so he comes like a thief in the night. And he's saying, this has happened to you before. It will happen again. You remember the, ten, the parable of the ten virgins? And you have five that had the oil in the lamp and five that were lazy and complacent. And then what happened was the groom came back, which represents Jesus. And he shuts them out. They're like, Lord, Lord. He's like, I don't know who you are. He shuts them out. He comes like a thief in the night. There will be no excuses when he comes. Oh, we were a really thriving church. We had all sorts of things going on, Jesus. And he says, well... You know, they will come to me in the end and say, Lord, Lord, I cast out demons in your name. I prophesied. And he's like, I don't know you. Who are you? Where do you get these funny gifts from? I didn't give them to you. You see the danger? This is the danger of where we are. Question to you, is the church napping? Have we left the secret path to the enemy open? Have we become complacent? I believe we have. And I believe Lynn spoke on the very area that is the secret path that the enemy is using greatly in this day with the sexuality stuff. I believe it's one of the biggest, biggest enemy works right now. So what must we do? Verse 4. Yet you have a few people in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes. They will walk with me, dressed in white, for they are worthy. You know this word soiled means defiled. They have defiled their holy, pure robes. They have taken on clothes of sinfulness and they have stopped pursuing holiness. They no longer have a holy God. They will turn him into a sinful God by saying that he accepts this sort of behavior. They have changed all of the things that God called them to be set apart and they've moved it on. What was the main headlines this week? Front page of the newspaper. No longer. We're we're having a big investigation in the Church of England. Should we call God Father? Well, of course, he's non-binary, so we don't want to call him Father. He's not a guy. He's a nothing. It's like, we're going to change that, right? Now, think about that just for one minute. So when we baptize, we're going to baptize in the name of the thing and the Son and the Holy Spirit, right? And Jesus says, well, you know, I I only do what I see my thing doing, you know? Do, Do you see what's going on here? Like, they are seriously seriously stepping out of line now. Seriously, it is grieving the Lord. This is serious. He's not going to bless it, and I'll prove it in a minute when we get there, if I get through this sermon some quicker time soon. But it's serious. It's really serious. What is it Jesus said? He said, Abba, Daddy, Father, Daddy, Abba. You know, are we going to say, well, no, it's the thing now. You know, Abba just got in there because they were a really good music group, right? You know, we're making a mockery of God. And since when has God got to... I mean, when you think about this, it's just coming to my mind. In Romans, it talks about election. And it's like, you know, something along the lines of, you know, the potter can, can do what he wants with, with what he makes. You know, you can have some for special uh, purposes and, and some for common use. You know, and he talks about Pharaoh being raised up for the very purpose to glorify God. And you think what Pharaoh went through, right? When, when he tried to take down God's people and then, you know, covered in the sea. And, and he says... God says, I will have mercy on whom I choose to have mercy. God isn't looking for our approval. If God chooses to wipe someone out in the Bible, in the world, he doesn't have to apologize to us. Why are we trying to make him so easy to tolerate and to swallow? We've grieved him. He hasn't grieved us. It's time for the church to wake up, and they need to do it very, very, very quickly. And this gender and sexuality thing is the big enemy weapon against this world and against God. It is so clear. It is so clear. uh, I'll I'll read something to you in a second, but I went to my my mentors last week, and he said, Mike, you've written this book, 
on sexuality and holiness. Here it is. And uh, he says, you don't really tell many people about it. You haven't really. And I said, well, to be honest, Jonathan, I said, the reason I haven't done that is because I didn't want to make it about me. He said, yeah, but Mike, did you feel God caused you to write this book? I said, yeah. And he said, do you think it's a prophetic message like I do? I said, yeah. He goes, then why are you hiding it? And when, when I was asked to write it, um, I, I was asked where I wanted my picture. I said, anywhere but on the book. And, and, and the reason being is I haven't written this to get famous. I haven't written this. I'm not going to. You know, believe me, I've read it myself. <laughs> and, uh, but, but here's the thing. It is, it is a prophetic message. I, I was stirred crazy to write this book, and I've never written anything in my life. You know, I barely read very well, and I believe it's a message. And if, if you're new to the church and you didn't know I've written it, do go on Amazon and get a, a copy of it. But what I'm trying to say to you is this. He's having a go at me about not telling people about it. He said, if God's told you to share this message, get it out there. And I was like, okay, well, well I will. I will do that. And, and it's interesting enough, when I started looking into this week, it turns out someone else has already done it for me. And it's, it's on the various uh, websites I didn't expect it to be and on, on the various Christian places. But what I'm trying to get to you is, in that book, I sat and I prayed about it over and over again. And I prayed about it before all of this stuff about God and sexuality and all that came up. I prayed and I released it because I believed it was a prophetic time. It talked about end times in there as well. I wrote it for this church to save you the heartache for going down the wrong paths. And I just want to say to you, read it. Read it. I'm not doing that to get me famous. I'm in debt for it. I'm not making money out of it. I wrote it for you to protect you. This is serious. We are in serious times. This week, the bishops of this country have gone and told us we shouldn't call God Father anymore. That is grievous. Listen to what J. John said about that. He said, the fact is, not everything that is planted deserves to come to fruition. And it is precisely the responsibility of bishops and even archbishops to do their best to ensure that the fields of the Lord produce a good crop for him. I'm afraid what seems to be proposed this week and defended by archbishops is not the sowing of acorns, but rather deadly weeds. I can only pray that God have mercy on his church. That is Canon J. John sticking his neck out. Do you think he would do that if he didn't know what he was talking about? This guy can be trusted. And he's saying we need to wake up and I pray mercy on this church. I pray mercy on this church. I believe the church has soiled its clothes. I believe that in the grace and mercy of God, we've turned it into a license to commit sin, which you'll read about in Jude, and it's not pretty reading. I believe that we've gone too far. I believe that we need to repent. And that was something that when the Holy Spirit came last Sunday, people started repenting all around the room. We didn't ask them to. And that's so important that we realize that we have offended the Lord. But there is hope. Because when Elijah went to the Lord and he said, I'm the only faithful prophet left, God. God says, no, you're not. I've got 7,000 sitting in a cave downstairs. He's like, I know where they are. I've got faithful people. And the, the thing that you need to know as a church is that there are still faithful people in this world that follow God's word. But you have to ask the question, if I want God in my midst, am I going to get it by bending his word? Thank you, Ted, for reading that at the beginning. I took the whole team aside. Uh, me and Matt Kefferty did most of the work. We did some training uh, for our staff team, trustees team, uh, and elders. And, uh, and one of the things that I spoke about a couple of weeks ago was this uh, badly quoted uh, scripture. And it's in Proverbs 29, 18. The people without vision will perish. And we use it all the time to like make it like it's vision, like a business. And it's completely not. This is the real, you know, the best translation is this. People without revelation run wild. And if you want to really translate it and what it means, revelation in that passage, and this is the King James Version, it means a people without God's instruction run wild. Do you see that? And what we've got in society and in the church right now is people are running wild because they've thrown away God's word. They've thrown away the truth of it. And they've decided to go their own way and they have run wild. And it's dangerous. It's dangerous. But Jesus ends with this wonderful encouragement. Verse 5 to 6. The one who is victorious will, like them, be dressed in white. I will never blot out the name of that person from the book of life. But I will acknowledge them, their name before my Father and his angels. 
whoever, angels, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Question for you. Where would you like your name to be up in lights? Is it Wembley Stadium? Is it the Albert Hall? Would you like your name to be on the newspapers? Would you like to be famous? Would you like to be known everywhere? I can tell you that you can have a reputation that says you're alive and you are really good. But Jesus says you can be dead. And the most important place you should want your name as a Christian is not in the worldly sphere, but it should be here in the book of life, in his book of life. And he says, you can have your name in the book of life. He clearly said to his disciples that when I come with all my angels, if you deny me, I will deny you. But if you acknowledge me, I will acknowledge you before my father. Surely that's where you want your name in his book. Father, Mike Williams, he preached for you and he gave his heart and he loved you and he was faithful or Mike Williams he scored some great goal in the FA Cup final but now he's dead and he's going somewhere nasty where do I want to be? I want to be in his book of life I've got two things to end with and I'm not going to ask the band to move because if you miss this it will just be a waste true revivals were centered not on power although power was available and obvious They were centered on three really key things. A realization of God's holiness. A realization of our sinfulness. And a realization to surrender to God's lordship. That's what they were truly about. Any other one that doesn't have those three things, they weren't real. They weren't real. Load of people falling over and getting healed and not following Jesus, they weren't real. A load of people uh, singing hallelujahs and speaking in funny languages. They weren't real. If they don't have at the center of it a repentance that turns to God and says, now you're my Lord. They weren't real. Oh gosh, throw stones at me. Some of the revivals that you all quote, they weren't real. Unless you turn to God and followed him. The revelation of your heart now to those that teach the Bible. This is for us, but these are for the bishops. If they want to listen back to this message today, they are more than welcome. But listen to this in Malachi. Malachi said this in uh, chapter 2, verse 5 to 9. First of all, he talks about the priests. And he says, this is what Levi should have been like. And then he moves on to what they have become. He says, my covenant was with him, Levi. Levi, a covenant of life and peace. And I gave them to him. This called for reverence. And he revered me and stood in awe of my name. True instruction was in his mouth, and nothing false was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness, and turned many from their sins. For the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge, not lies, because he is the messenger of the Lord Almighty, and people seek instruction from his mouth. Hold it there before I get to what they've become. got to stop telling preachers what they can preach. God put shepherds over you to protect you and to guide you, not to be puppets to you. They listen to him. And of course, you'll get false teachers, but don't you dare keep telling pastors and preachers what they can say, because otherwise you will run wild. Finally, this is what they become, and this is what he says after that. But you have turned from the way. And by your teaching have caused many to stumble. You have violated the covenant with Levi, says the Lord Almighty. So I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before the people. Because you have not followed my ways, but have shown partiality in the matters of the law. He is Lord. He is our father and he instructs his chosen preachers and teachers so that we can lead you into the way of everlasting. Don't follow the world and do not follow those false teachers this week that have grieved him greatly. If the band would like to come back, we will respond by worshiping him.
Let's stand to worship everybody.